It is now time for a question period. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker. And this morning, my question is to the Premier. Premier, during his fall fiscal update, your Minister of Finance revealed that his revenue projections from just four months earlier were short by more than half a billion dollars. Your finance minister then tried to reassure Ontario taxpayers that he had the discipline to eliminate the deficit over the next three years. Then on November 18th, we saw his real plan revealed when he refused to rule out once again raising taxes. Premier, can you commit here this morning that your government will not be raising taxes yet again over the next three years? Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the plan that we are implementing— I'm going to start right off. Anyone interjects, I'm going to stop them. Please carry on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the plan that we are implementing is a balanced one, and it's been laid out clearly. Uh, it was laid out in the budget when we introduced it in May. It was laid out in our platform, Mr. Speaker. Member from Renfrew, come to order. Uh, the budget that Member we, uh, from Leeds, Granville, that we, come to order. We brought back to the legislature after the election, Mr. Speaker. So it's very clear that we are limiting our spending, but at the same time, we are best investing in Ontario. We have committed to uh, uh, balancing and eliminating. Eliminating the deficit by 2017-18, we're on path to do that, Mr. Speaker. We've overachieved on our targets, and the reality is that the reality is that there is uh, there is a revenue challenge that we're facing, Mr. Yes, Speaker. But that's all the more important. That makes it all the more important that we make those investments so that we can Thank see you. that economic growth. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. Your Minister of Finance's fall fiscal update clearly stated that should revenues fall further, he would look at other tools to balance the budget. The House Leader, come to Later, when asked by reporters five separate times if he would increase taxes, he avoided answering the questions entirely. A responsible government should have a plan to balance a budget by living within its means. Your government appears determined to go ahead and raise taxes on hardworking Ontario families one more time. Premier, is your finance minister committed to balancing the budget without raising taxes. So, Mr. Speaker, as I've said, our plan has been quite clearly laid out in, yeah. uh, in the budget. We are implementing that for five years in a row. Ontario has exceeded its deficit targets, Mr. Speaker. It's one of the only governments in Canada to have achieved this level of uh, success. And by Member from Stormont, our targets, come to order. Mr. Speaker, our accumulated Member deficit is $25 billion, $25 billion lower than it would otherwise have been. Let me talk about some of the other tools. Crack Cracking down on the underground economy, and that includes contraband tobacco, Mr. Speaker. Managing compensation costs, and we know that the uh, the president of the Treasury Board is actively engaged in that. Making sure that businesses are paying their taxes, Mr. Speaker. Making sure that we're getting all of that revenue. Correcting the vertical imbalance with the with the federal government. It's very important that we work with the federal government to make sure that Ontario is getting its fair share, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We are working to maximize the value of our assets, and that's the work that Ed Clark and his commission. Have done, and we're doing a program review Thank across you. government. Those are the tools that we're using, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Premier, we have seen this act before by your government, yep. promising a plan to balance some budget when no such plan actually exists, shifting the blame for the incompetent handling of Ontario's fisc fiscal situation on everyone else but those responsible, and then capping the irresponsible behaviour off with a tax increase on hardworking Ontario families. When your Minister of Finance was asked if he would commit to avoiding further tax increases, he dodged the question altogether. Premier, again I ask you, will you commit to a plan to balance the books without raising a single tax? Thank you, Speaker, our plan has been laid out very clearly, and the, men, the member opposite has chosen to ignore the answer. I just went through six, uh, six initiatives that we are taking. One of them does talk about the federal government and the relationship with the federal government, Mr. Speaker, but there are five others that are tools that we are using to work our way to eliminating the deficit by 2017-18. So I have answered the question in terms of the path that we have laid out. That is the path that we are on. Those Member are the missions that we are taking, order. Mr. Speaker, and that is the way we will get to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. New question. Member from Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, uh, my second set of questions this morning is to the finance minister. 
Minister, on numerous occasions, you've been asked to clarify your plans to utilize what you have called new revenue tools in order to meet your campaign pledge to balance a budget within three years. Just this morning, I asked the Premier three straightforward questions on the same subject, which she obviously refused to answer. So let's distill this down to something even more basic, Minister. Minister, you recently refused to rule out raising taxes to fix your government's failing financial position. But, Minister, can you answer this simple question? Will you commit that you will not raise the HST before the next election? Minister of Finance. Oh, Mr. Speaker, this is great. The man who wants to be the leader of a party is looking at trying to show vision before the public and before the people of Ontario. And he is. He is now trying to make things up as he goes, Mr. Speaker. We put forward a budget. We put forward a public update. We laid out very clearly what it is that we need to achieve by building a path to balance that talks about integrity of our revenue, ensuring fairness in our tax system, making certain the underground economy is addressed. Look at those that are evading. Look at the leakage in our system. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we're looking at maximizing our assets to increase our dividends. We're continuing to do our savings finding ways to improve our overall expenses, which, by the way, has made Ontario Answer. the lowest-cost government in Canada because of the measures that we've taken. We're going to continue Thank doing you. that, and we'll continue, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Minister, hard-working taxpayers Sorry. in Ontario Sorry. already pay their fair share of taxes. You owe it to them and everybody in the province to be crystal clear. Minister, will you today rule out raising personal income taxes on Ontario workers between now and the next election? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the member who's asking the question when he was the Labour critic, his only plan was to fire 100,000 people. That is not what we're doing. We're trying to ensure that we support the system and invest. So we talk now about. The member from Simcoe North will come to order. Please finish. So, as the member talks about right to work legislation and forcing people into lower. And if it happens again, you'll be warned. Carry on. So, as the member opposite talks about right to work legislation, putting people in vulnerable positions in the lowest wages that are, that are possible, we're trying to find ways not only to control our expenses by making our path to balance effective, we're also being fair by ensuring we stimulate yes, economic growth, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're investing in people and their skills. That's why we're investing in modern infrastructure, creating over 100,000 jobs last year. Member from Chatham, Ken Essex, and we come are to controlling. Order. Thank you. Final supplementary. Minister, as you know, my background is in small businesses. In small business, Minister, small businesses employ the majority of workers in this province. Indeed, small and medium-sized businesses are the cornerstone of our local communities. They are also the backbone of Ontario's economy. Minister, will you today rule out raising taxes on small businesses between now and the next election? Minister. So, Mr. Speaker. Again, we have been supporting small business. In fact, it was that party that delayed the implementation of the elimination of the employer health tax for 90 per cent of all businesses in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We have just passed the Business Climate Act that will reduce red tape. In fact, CFIB has applauded the step that we're taking in the right direction to support small business. As I was saying just a moment ago, we have maintained the lowest and most dynamic Tax the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order second time. Mr. Speaker. The member from Renfrew is warned. Carry on. Because of our attractive, dynamic uh, tax system, we have now become the top destination for foreign direct investment. More startups are happening in Ontario than anywhere else in Canada combined, and we will continue to support businesses. We'll continue to do what's necessary to provide that integrity, and, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to do so even though the members opposite have actually voted against those measures. Thank you. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Affordable childcare spaces in Ontario are closing, and the response of the Liberal Minister was, quote, 
I'm really quite, I'm really, I'm not really quite sure what the problem is. Health care is being cut, and people are feeling Deputy it's House Leader, come to order. And the Second response time. of the Liberal Minister was, quote, we're not making cuts. People on social assistance have been left without support that they rely on, Speaker. And the response of the Liberal Minister was, this is making, quote, a mountain out of a very small molehill. Mm. The Liberals are looking more and more arrogant and out of touch by the day, Speaker. Will the Premier acknowledge that people are being hurt by her budget and her minister's incompetence and insens insensitivity? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, <laughs> I obviously I reject the premise of uh, the question, but what I will say, Mr. Speaker, is that I acknowledge that there are people in Ontario who are struggling. There are people in Ontario who are looking for childcare. I understand that, Mr. Speaker. That's why it's very important to me that the legislation that uh, uh, moves through this House, Mr. Speaker, is going to make childcare safer and has the potential to create 6,000 new childcare spaces, Mr. Speaker. I know that there are people in this province who are looking for care for their loved ones, Mr. Speaker. That's why we continue to increase the support for community care. We continue to increase the budget for community care so that people will get the health care that they need when they need it. Mr. Speaker, I know there were families Answer. who suffered because they didn't get their checks as uh, quickly as they should have, and that's why the minister is working very hard Thank to you. rectify that situation. Thank that's what I will acknowledge, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the Liberals actually don't seem to get it. Health care cuts are real, Speaker. Child care spaces have been closed in this province yeah. under their watch. And the Liberal Social Assistance software rollout has been a gong show, Speaker. These have had real impacts on the people of this province. Does the Premier get that people and families are suffering under her watch? Understand that there is a, a complexity in making sure that 13.5 million people have the services that they need. Yep. I understand that there are thousands of uh, children, Mr. Speaker, in this province who have access to full-day kindergarten because of the policies that we put in place, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. And what that, what that 470,000 children have benefited from full-day kindergarten as of this year, Mr. Speaker. So what I know is that that has helped families. That has helped families in every riding across this sure province. Are. are there still people who are looking for the right child care Answer. arrangement for their children? Absolutely. And we're going to continue to work, including the legislation that was just passed that will create 6,000 new safe child care spaces. You know what, Speaker, there's an old saying that you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Health care services have been cut, even though the Minister of Health denies it. Whether it's cuts to home care in Windsor, Speaker, Minister of Economic Development, reducing come to order. access to operating rooms by half in local community hospitals. These are cuts, full stop. Is the Premier going to continue to stand Minister in this Children House and, services, and deny order. that the health care services are being cut in Ontario? Thank you. Yes, I am, Mr. Speaker, because that's not the reality. The reality is that we continue to invest more money in health care. We continue to invest more money in the reduction of wait times for people across the system, and we continue to invest more money in community care. Is it complex to run a health care system for 13.5 million people? It absolutely is, Mr. Speaker. Is it necessary that we make changes so that we can transform that system so that it will be the best that it can be for the long term? Yes. Absolutely. So we're going through a transformation, Mr. Speaker, and if we were not to do that, then we would not be responsible. It is easy for the leader of the third party to stand up and pick on a particular issue in a particular community. Answer. We have to rectify those, but our responsibility is also to deal with the whole system and make Thank sure you. that it is functioning yeah. at the highest level. Stop the clock. You seated, please. You seated. New question, Leader of the Third Party. The Premier Speaker, when Coronation Park Day Nursery in Sarnia shut its doors because of liberal cuts, the minister said she didn't understand the problem. Speaker, while well, I went there, the problem is simple. There are no children at Coronation Park Day Nursery anymore. The minister doesn't seem to get what this means to families in Sarnia. 
Does the Premier understand if her minister does it? Minister of Agriculture, come to order. At least understand why cutting childcare spaces is minister a problem. Minister of Culture and Sport, come to order. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I don't, I don't know the specifics of that particular situation. I know the Minister of Education will want to comment. But, but let me just say this. that. As we have introduced full day kindergarten, Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt. There is no doubt. Minister, and I say the member, the member from Kitchener Waterloo, come to order. There is no doubt that there is a transition that is happening in the childcare system. We understand that four and five year olds who would have been in childcare, Mr. Speaker, are now in full day kindergarten. I might add, saving those families thousands of dollars a year so that they can have those kids in full day kindergarten, Mr. Speaker. So what that means is, in the child care system, there is a transition so that children who have been on the waiting list, who will be younger, Mr. Speaker, they are now, they are now finding their way into the child care system. That is a change. It is a transformation. But, Mr. Speaker, it is a very good Thank thing you. that 470,000 children have had full-day kindergarten. Thank you. Supplementary. Family relies on social assistance and the money never shows up. That's a major problem. But not only did the minister insist that the problem was a very small molehill, she refused to even apologize, Speaker. Why won't the Premier acknowledge that in addition to fixing this, problems, this problem, Ontarians deserve an apology? Premier. Speaker, I believe that the minister did apologize to the families who, uh, who were uh, affected by this, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very sorry, and I say it to the families who, uh, who uh, were affected by this, but, Mr. Speaker, the reality is the system that is being put in place is a better system than was there before. The system will allow more time for caseworkers to work with families, and that's a very good thing because that relationship is extremely important. Uh, the minister has been in touch with municipalities. She has worked to make sure that wherever there was a, an impact on a family, that that is being rectified. But, Mr. Speaker, I go once again to the responsibility of government, and that is to make the changes that are responsible, that will improve service to people yes, over sir. the long term. This is about a very large system, Mr. Speaker, 500,000 checks a month that go out. We better make sure Thank we've you. got a system that works for people in the long term. Final Speaker, what this is about is services that are being cut and people that are feeling it. That's what this is about. But an arrogant, out-of-touch Liberal government seems to believe that they just need to deny, 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 and somehow that's going to stop being true. Can the Premier tell us, Speaker, why her arrogant Liberal government is denying what everyone else can see as a plain fact? Well, Mr. Speaker, I understand that when a question is written down and the supplementaries are written down, that you read the question and then the supplementaries. But the fact is, I have not denied that there are people who are struggling. I have not denied that there are impacts that come about because of the changes that we are making. What I do deny, Mr. Speaker, is that we are cutting services for the sake of cutting services. That is not the reality. We are going through, whether it's in the implementation of a new uh, technology for making sure that people on social assistance have more time with their caseworkers, or whether it's the implementation of full-day kindergarten, which does have an impact on childcare, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's making sure that people have the health care that they need, where they need it, when they need it. Those are system changes, Mr. Speaker. They are necessary Answer. for the long-term well-being of the 13.5 million people in Ontario. I don't deny that there, that change is necessary. What I'm Thank saying you. is that we must make those changes, and that's what we're doing. Thank you. New question, the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister and Estimates Committee, your office testified that the new SAM system, software built by a company called CureM and now owned by IBM, is a modern, commercial, off-the-shelf application. When questioned about CureM's serious software flaws experienced Order, by please. legislators in Minnesota and Maryland, your Assistant Deputy Minister, Martin Thume, testified that it failed in those states because, and I quote, they didn't do the testing they needed to do before they implemented, end of quote. Minister, for you, there was no rush to implement. In fact, you had four years to test the system and get it right. You extended the rollout deadline twice because of glitches, and, and you still didn't stop until you rolled out. You just steamrolled through, Minister. You now wear this failure. You had all the time in the world. You wear it. What's your excuse, Minister? Minister of Community and Social Services. 
Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Bruce Grayo and Sound for the question. I think we need to go back to understand why, in fact, we implemented SAMS in the first place. Uh, you will perhaps recall uh, that we had a very outdated system. It was one that was brought in under the former PC government in 2002. In, in 2009, the Auditor General put together a report on ODSP and Ontario Works and raised a number of issues with respect to the old system to SDMT. There were security and access control Hello. issues, there was a lack of user satisfaction on the part of the frontline workers, and there were long-standing system errors. So our government recognized the system was outdated and no longer tenable. That is why we decided on this investment Order. in a new system that will better support staff Qu that deliver answer. social assistance and ultimately Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, will better serve the people who rely on our programs. Thank you. Supplementary Thank you. lesson. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Community and uh, Social Services. The, out, the old system, at least, made sure that those checks arrived in time and our most needy didn't suffer, Minister. Yep. Your government is averse to doing proper research. You failed to do it on Mars, you failed to do it on e Orange, and you certainly failed to do it on eHealth. It's evident you also failed to do your research on this new computer system. You had four years and multiple warnings from Minnesota, Maryland, OPSU, your frontline staff, our PC members in Estimates Committee. Yet here you are, left with a $20 million mess. This is a combination of overpayments, missed and delayed payments. People are going without minister. Mr. Speaker, though the party opposite may feel it's acceptable to allow the needs of Ontario's most vulnerable citizens to go unaddressed, we in the PC party do not. The Premier said sorry. If she's really sorry, Minister, what you will do, and we're asking you the same question I asked yesterday, will question. you bring those people from the front line back to the estimates so we can get to the bottom of this, and those people that are the most needy don't suffer because Thank of you. your that carelessness again? Good idea. Good idea. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, let's just get one thing straight. Our government has as its one, number one concern the help and uh, uh, assistance for those most vulnerable members in society at the core of the values that our party stands for. And it's truly ironic to hear the member opposite, who, under their government, there was a cut of some 22 per cent of social assistance rates. We remain committed to working closely with our frontline staff, and we will implement SAMS, and we will continue to provide support to our clients. Our focus in the near future uh, relies on us all working together. This is caseworkers on the front line, the support staff that is there to assist them, whether they be in municipal settings or in ODSP offices. And we have Answer. confidence that SAMS will be a better solution for both the caseworkers and the people uh, we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Wellington. Uh, my question is to the Premier. On Monday, the minister told the South that the government has a contract with IBM to assist us with the transition of going live with SAMS. Will the Premier release that contract today? Thank you. Premier? Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Community and Social Services. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, indeed, uh, the government, uh, through uh, proper channels, obviously uh, engaged a vendor of record to implement this particular system. Uh, it is uh, uh, something that we've been working on and with uh, the vendor in Curam, now owned by IBM, uh, for the last three and a half years. Uh, clearly, uh, technical support is provided and is uh, continuing to be provided through this particular transition. And we're working closely uh, with our partners in the field to ensure that they get the kind of support they need uh, pursuant uh, to our agreement with them and uh, through the provision of these services. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. you, Supplementary. According to the reports, uh, the government has found 65 defects in the SAMS program which have led to the massive problems with social assistance money reaching the most vulnerable Ontarians. Apparently, we have a contract to deal with these problems. When the state of Minnesota had problems, IBM sent at least 80 technical workers to fix the problems. Have any IBM workers been dispatched to solve these problems, and how much are we paying them to actually fix the defects in their own software? Thank you. Minister. 
Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, we continue to work with uh, uh, a very active uh, technical support team available to municipalities. In my conversations with the mayors of uh, such cities as Hamilton, uh, Sudbury, Ottawa, uh, and uh, Windsor, uh, I've made it very clear that this kind of support is available to them. Uh, we've actually set up some dedicated hotlines uh, wherever the, a payment issue is identified, and so these are issues are prioritized. Uh, I would like to mention, though, at this point, uh, that we still are finding it very difficult to validate some of the anecdotes that we're hearing and have been printed in the media. Uh, the issue that Member we from Kitchener Waterloo, come to order. To the overpayment issue, uh, and uh, that, as uh, we've stated, has been corrected by the technical team. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. New question: The member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, Ontario forestry industry is a critical part of our economy. In fact, the forestry industry employs over 160,000 Ontarians in about 260 communities across this great province. And although most Ontarians believe the forestry industry is only in northern Ontario, it may surprise you, Mr. Speaker, that I have a mill in my own riding in Northumberland Quinney West. However, the best part about this industry is that sustainability of the resources with approximately 25.6 million hectares of forest certify a sustainable more than twice the size of the state of Ohio. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, sure. what are you doing to ensure the Government of Ontario is a growing forestry sector? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestries. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the member for the question. It's my understanding that it is uh, Sweet Lou Rinaldi's birthday today, so I want to wish the member a happy birthday. Speaker, he is right when he suggests that the sector has uh, gone through some very challenging times, not just here in Ontario, but right across the country, Ontario, BC and Quebec as the major forestry producing jurisdictions in the country. Our government stepped up to the plate. We've invested over $1.3 billion in forestry since 2005, including about $570 million, Speaker, for a roads program, a program that I would say was downloaded onto the backs of the forestry companies by the NDP when they had their turn in oh, government, no, also including $130 million in stumpage relief, $170 million in electricity relief, $22.5 million grant to uh, Resolute Forest Products for their mill in Fort Francis is one of the investments that we made Answer. on the capital side. Speaker, when the industry faced challenges related to global competition, a rising Canadian dollar, a global recession and a decline in the U.S. housing market, we Thank invested you. and we're now seeing them coming through and increasing their Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry for his response and leadership on this important issue. Mr. Speaker, my constituents have been listening to the acquisition from the third party over the past few weeks regarding a mill in Fort Francis, a mill that's very important to the town, like many mills in small towns across Ontario. And though a private company owns the mill, I know how critical it is that this mill be heated through the winter to ensure there remains a viable asset in case a buyer comes forward. Mr. Speaker, through you, could the minister report to the House what he has done to ensure that this mill remains heated throughout the winter months? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, again, I thank the, uh, the member for the question. It is accurate that over the course of the last several weeks, uh, our office and our ministry has spent a great deal of time trying to work forward on a plan and a program with the owner of the mill a privately owned asset to see that that asset could be preserved should a new uh, potential buyer step forward to purchase the asset. We did not come to a successful conclusion on a deal with Resolute, so there is no formal deal between our government and the owner of the mill, but we have publicly heard that the owner of the mill, Resolute Forest Products, has indicated that they will heat the asset in what they're calling asset protection mode. I had a long conversation with Mayor Avis of Fort Francis. I indicated very clearly to him the language that Resolute is using in terms of what they will do in the asset. Uh, and we're hopeful that that means that it will be maintained in a state that should a potential buyer come forward, that asset protection mode would reflect an yes, asset sir. that somebody would still be interested in buying. Speaker, thank, thank you for your... No question, the member from Halliburton, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Minister, you've been mandated by the Premier to be the most open and transparent government in the country. Time to start. Yet 14 agencies under your watch have not tabled their annual reports in the House. Um, the Ontario Place Corporation, which falls under your watch, has not tabled an annual report since 2010. Wow. So, Minister, why has it taken three years and still no annual rep reports for Ontario Place have not been tabled in this House? Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are committed to responsible fiscal management and accountability and transparency in our government. And that's why the annual reports and expenses for ministry agencies, agencies are available publicly. Good. There's a process in place for these reports before they're made public. They must be submitted by the ministry. They must be approved by the minister, approved by cabinet, and tabled within the legislature. And my ministry has received the 2012-13 annual reports from all of its agencies, and these reports are still in the approval pro process and will be available for the public once they're tabled in the legislature. Thank you. Supplementary. So, in the case of Ontario Place, the financial report reports are, are now listed online in public accounts for 2011 and 2012, just to update you. But the ministry has sat on those reports for almost a year, and in them, the Auditor General notes concerns of pending legal action relating to the closure of Ontario Place. So, in fact, last year, an additional $4 million was spent on unforeseen closing costs, according to your former deputy minister. So, Minister, what are you trying to hide? And when will the annual reports for 2011, 2012, and 2013 in respect to Ontario Place be tabled in this legislature? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have personally signed the 2011 2012 annual report for Ontario Place, and I expect them to be tabled within the legislature very shortly. We're excited about Ontario Place. You know, Ontario Place was uh, built in the, uh, in the, in, in the early 70s, and Mr. Speaker, it is a great facility that we've invested uh, time and energy again. into, and we plan to bring back that public asset to the public so they can access it the same way I was able to access it with my family when I was a young guy. Thanks Thank a lot. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Two weeks ago, we were told that Ontario had joined with Quebec to set seven conditions for approval of the Energy East pipeline. But last week, the Premier called Alberta Premier Jim Prentice and reassured him that Ontario had not set any conditions at all. The seven principles, as the Premier describes them, are more like suggestions. They are weaker and narrower than Quebec's seven conditions. In particular, Quebec is committed to a provincial environmental assessment of the Energies Project. Ontario so far has not. Will the Premier follow the lead of Quebec and commit to a full provincial environmental assessment of the Energies Pipeline? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I know that the, uh, the member opposite has uh, listened to what uh, both Premier Cuillard and I and this morning Premier Prentice have said in the public realm, Mr. Speaker. We've been very clear that the principles that we put in place are things that we believe need to be considered, need to be part of the discussion that, at the National Energy Board, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that the NEB has jurisdiction over this decision, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Energy, uh, through the Ontario Energy Board has uh, put a process in place that will gather input, Mr. Speaker, that will form the body of the, uh, of the intervention with the National Energy Board. But, Mr. Speaker, I have been working very hard with premiers across this country to put in place a Canadian energy strategy. I believe that having a Canadian energy strategy that looks at how we Answer. can all do our part, Mr. Speaker, whether it's on greenhouse gas emissions or whether it's on clean, renewable energy, Mr. Speaker, we all all have a role to play, and that's the work that I've been doing with premiers across the country. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, as you sometimes say, I heard a no. Unlike Quebec, Ontario refuses to conduct a provincial environmental assessment of Energy East. The Premier says the federal process is good enough, even after Stephen Harper gutted the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. But provinces like British Columbia and Quebec have refused to leave their fate in the hands of Stephen Harper. Their premiers have said pipeline projects in their provinces will not proceed unless it is in their province's interests. Will the premier make the same commitment to the people of Ontario? Premier. Minister of Energy. 
Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member would know that the National Energy Board has jurisdiction over this issue. That's number one. The province of Ontario and all the other provinces can only go there as interveners and provide information. By the time we're ready to make the submissions, Mr. Speaker, there will not be enough time to complete an environmental assessment. That's number one. Number two, we were ahead of the game almost a year ago by asking the Ontario Energy Board to consult across the province of Ontario. There were technical inputs, there were sociological inputs, there are all kinds of inputs that we received in our consultation. The consultation is not yet completed, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. Since the application has just been filed recently, we are going to open up the, uh, the uh, consultations once again. And so all the environmentalists, all the businesses, the, uh, the gas companies, Mr. Speaker, who are opposed to TransCanada, they yes, will sir. have input into our consultation. It's thorough, it's complete, we're ahead of the game, and I don't know how Quebec is going to do it anymore. The question the member from Scarborough, Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructures. As you're well aware, today is the United Nations International Day of Pe Persons with Disabilities. Today, the world is promoting a deeper understanding of disability issues and mobilize support to foster a more inclusive society. Here in Ontario, I'm proud of our government for passing the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act. 2005, which helped to create a more inclusive Ontario regardless of ability. Ontario is recognized as a world leader in accessibility. We are first in the world to move a more modern regulatory regime that mandates accessibility. We are the first in the world that requires staff to be trained on accessibility. We are first in Canada with legislation that clearly outlines the goals and timelines. Speaker, through you to the minister, can Question. the minister responsible for AODA please inform the House about the progress of our government has made to make Ontario more accessible? Well, I am the minister of yeah. Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for joining myself and a number of our colleagues this morning uh, here in the legislature and in getting together with Community Living and March of Dimes to celebrate the UN International Day of Persons with Disabilities, it is a great time to thank uh, accessibility champions across the province of, uh, of the important work that they've done and the great progress that we've made. Together, we've made Ontario not just accessible, Mr. Mr. Speaker, but one of the most accessible, if not the most accessible, uh, leader in, in the entire world. What a great competitive advantage. It's something to be very, very proud of, not just for us, but for accessibility champions across the province. Uh, the 2010 Martin Prosperity Institute outlined that uh, having an inclusive Ontario would, would see a $7.9 billion uh, investment in gross domestic products. So, Mr. Speaker, this isn't only good for our society. It's not only good for people with disabilities. This is something that's Thank crucial you. to our competitiveness as an economy. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank the minister for giving up an update about the steps that the Ontario government is making to make Ontario accessible. I know the Pan and Parapan Am Games are putting strong focus on accessibility in our province next summer. The Games will showcase Ontario's para-athletes to the world. We are hosting 2,000 400 para-athletes and team officials and broadcasting for the first time ever para-pan sports on TV live. The Games are helping to grow para-sports world. In conjunction with the Games, the first ever Canadian Wheelchair Basketball Academy was created by Wheelchair Basketball Canada. Today, a high-performance wheelchair basketball athletes are trained at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. These athletes have already begun using the world's first full-time year-round daily Question. training centre. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please explain the various strategy our government is taking to make para pan and games more accessible? Minister. The minister responsible for the pan para pan games. Minister responsible. Thank you. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Scarborough Agent Court for her uh, important question. We're committed to making sure that the para pan am and the pan am games uh, in 2015 are the most accessible games ever. In every planning stage of the games, we thought about how to make this experience available to all people of all abilities. Uh, 
All existing sporting venues are completely accessible, and every new build was designed with accessibility in mind. And um, if you go out to uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Scarborough Aquatic Centre, you will see it is uh, perhaps the most accessible facility in North America. Wow. And on, when you go inside, you can uh, you can see a custom-built accessible ergometer that gives athletes in wheelchair the ability to alter their force and power while training. Wow. In the center, um, there's a um, heat uh, uh, treatment recovery system that rehabilitates athletes called the HydroWorks 2000, and it has an underwater treadmill resistant jet technology and many other state of the art yes, features. We are working, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that these games are the most accessible ever. We are so proud, and that's why 23,000 uh, Ontarians will be trained in accessibility training Thank to you. accommodate everyone. The uh, member from Holman and Norfolk. So, oh, Speaker, uh, my, minute, or my question is to the Minister of uh, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Where's, oh, I think he was on the list to leave early. Uh, let me check, please. Oh, is that right? So, to the Premier. Uh, I'm still going to provide the member with an opportunity to redirect. If you could do that for me, please. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, perhaps the Premier then. <clears throat> in uh, Manitoba, <clears throat> beekeepers have recently experienced uh, higher than normal bee mortality, and to assist with this financial burden of these uncontrollable losses, Manitoba has an insurance program to help their uh, bee colonies. Beekeepers are paid an indemnity if overwinter losses exceed the uh, coverage deductible. Premium costs for this program are shared 40 percent by the insured beekeeper, 24 percent by the province of Manitoba, and 30, 36 percent by the Government of Canada. So, uh, Premier, we in the PC caucus, uh, we are asking, uh, your government has had 11 years, why have you not implemented a Manitoba-type insurance model to help our Ontario beekeepers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, we have implemented an Ontario program, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the uh, the reality is that we have put in place supports for beekeepers who had uh, who had uh, the winter losses that we that we saw last year, Mr. Speaker, and we are working with the industry to make sure that we have an appropriate and balanced approach going forward. And part of that is to prevent the bee deaths. That is uh, that is what we are uh, we're aiming at, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change will want to comment on the specific around uh, those changes, but we know, Mr. Speaker, that it's very important that we support the beekeepers who have had these, uh, these winter losses, and at the same time, we put a precautionary approach in place that will allow us to uh, prevent the bee deaths going Answer, forward. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. You know, our beekeepers, they need a very practical approach. Uh, government does they're run they're insurance uh, programs. Uh, I've had bees on my farms for 38 years, and uh, I have seen the losses over the years, well before Neonex for that matter. But Manitoba, they, they have an insurance program that's up and running right now. Alberta has a, a similar program. Now we see that Saskatchewan has started a bee mortality insurance pilot project. It's run through the Saskatchewan Crop Insurance Corporation to cover loss of honeybees over the winter. They have tough winters, uh, as we know, just like we had last winter. The pilot will run for three years before being evaluated to decide if it will continue. It will bring Saskatchewan in line with the bee insurance programs that are they're already there in Manitoba. They're already there in Alberta. Uh, you haven't followed Manitoba's lead over the last 11 years. You uh, didn't follow Alberta's lead. Question. Well, Ontario, at least consider the pilot project Saskatchewan is in place to provide risk insurance, again, to help our beekeepers in Thank Ontario. Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I want to thank the member opposite for the question, and I have great respect for uh, his. Uh, his work as a producer and, and as a beekeeper, and we'll hope he'll take the time to have a coffee with me later to discuss this, because I think this is not a partisan issue. But, Mr. Speaker, we are, uh, we are moving forward. You don't talk to me about the truth, my friend. Um, the, uh, 
Mr. S Mr. Speaker, we're working right now on a very similar program to the other provinces as well, but we're focused on the priority of actually reducing bee losses, Mr. Speaker, because we don't think that's good for the environment or for beekeepers or for or for crop producers, because bees are such a critical part on their own, the managed bee population of our farm economy, and they're important, Mr. Speaker. Answer. So I hope the member opposite will support measures that will reduce the need for the people of Ontario to actually have to pay out for losses. I, I assume that would be comfortable with my friends and Thank the you. official opposition of reducing the cost of government. Thank you. To your question, the member, for, the member from Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Since 2003, the Domestic Violence Death Review Committee coroner has reported on deaths due to domestic violence in the province, and each year makes recommendations to various levels of government. In their report released this morning, ARC points out that while some progress has been made on those recommendations, much more needs to be done. Shamefully, not all ministries and agencies contacted for this report bothered to respond to each of the recommendations. And worse, not all agencies and ministries have bothered to implement the recommendations made in the coroner's domestic violence reviews. Speaker, 251 women have died as a result of domestic violence in the 10 years since the DVDRC started examining this issue. Just last week, members in this House wore purple scarves in recognition of violence against women, so I know that it's a priority for the legislators in this legislature. Question. Premier, what will this government do to establish monitoring mechanisms and implement these recommendations? Thank you, Premier. Minister responsible for children and youth services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for this very important question. And we all, I think, want to thank the Domestic Violence Death Review Committee for the report, and we'll all be reviewing the recommendations very carefully. I think at the end of the day, Speaker, we all have the exact same goal, which is Ontario free of domestic violence. And of course, my heart goes out to uh, the family uh, that was highlighted in the, the media, uh, I think just today, uh, a terrible domestic uh, tragedy that affected an entire family. And as the minister responsible for women's issues, uh, it is a priority for me and all of us that Ontario's uh, women and everyone feel safe in their homes, their workplace and their communities. While Ontario has some of the lowest rates of domestic violence across Canada, we absolutely know there's more work to be done, Speaker, and that's why our government has increased funding for community services that help victims of uh, domestic violence. That has been increased by 48 per cent, Speaker, since 2003. Answer. More work to do. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, unfortunately, just today there was a report of a mother and her two children who were murdered in Toronto on the weekend, having struggled to find housing in order to flee a violent situation. Access to emergency housing is one of the recommendations that is in the coroner's report. Access to emergency housing remains a problem in the province of Ontario. One of the recommendations is that shelters and second-stage housing continue to receive support and funding that keeps pace with inflation. Speaker, what this group wants is to return to the legislature next year to give this government an A for implementing the recommendations in the coroner's domestic violence review. Why won't this government Government do everything in its power to ensure that all ministries and agencies comply with the coroner's recommendations to end violence against women and to implement these very important recommendations. Good, good. Good, Minister. I think we'll all agree that one domestic violence act is one too many. One death associated with domestic violence is too many, and uh, that's why we have to keep making the investments we've, we've been making. Last week, my colleague, the Minister of Community and Social Services, announced an additional $14.5 million over the next three years to support women's shelters, counselling agencies and transitional housing. And our government started making these investments at a time when the former government, in fact, was cutting funding to women's shelters and support. I am pleased that next week I'll be making an important funding announcement with the Neighbour, Friends and Family Immigration Refugee Campaign that will help women and their families affected by domestic violence access to sports that are culturally and linguistically relevant Answer. and accessible. We remain very committed, Speaker, to uh, Ontario free of domestic violence and sexual assault and sexual violence because we firmly Thank believe you. that every woman has the right to feel safe and secure. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Davenport. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The members of my riding in Davenport have been asking me about the new Mental Health and Addictions Leadership Advisory Council and its plan to provide better access, better quality and better value. The minister announced an important expansion of our mental health strategy that would help us improve access to services, reduce wait times and close the gaps in our system. To help guide the implementation of this plan, our government announced a new Mental Health and Addictions Leadership Advisory Council. The council will provide advice on the strategy's investments promote collaboration across sectors, and report annually on the strategy's progress. The Council will be chaired by Susan Piggott, and the members of the Council include people who have had experienced a mental health and addiction challenge, as well as leaders from across different sectors that serve people with mental health Question. addictions. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I ask, what are the priorities of this Council, and what do they plan on achieving? Thank you, Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, and thanks to the member from Davenport for this very important question. Uh, the council that she's referring to, the members will provide uh, the government with important advice as we move forward with her mental health and addictions strategy phase two's top five priorities. And these priorities include promoting resiliency and well-being for all Ontarians by expanding proven programs in schools and in the workplace, as well as drawing on public health expertise uh, on mental health promotion and addiction prevention. Mr. Speaker, we're going to also, as a priority, ensure that early identification and intervention is available for those with mental illness and addictions. We're going to, as a third priority, expand housing, employment supports, and initiatives to reduce contact with the criminal justice system, uh, providing the right care at the right time and in the right place through initiatives such as better service coordination, addressing gap, gaps in the system, and improving transitions. We're also going to be establishing a new funding model uh, linked to population need, quality improvement, and service integration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. We know that approximately one in five young people in Ontario, that's more than two million, are dealing with mental health issues like anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. And approximately 70 percent of mental health and addiction problems begin in childhood and adolescence. Nearly 30 percent of my constituents in Davenport are below the age of 25. The promotion of overall healthy well-being is absolutely crucial for these young people. Many community organizations help young people increase self-esteem, such as the Dover Court Boys and Girls Club and others, which provide support through services such as counseling like the Abrigo Centre and the Davenport Perth Neighbourhood and Community Health Centre. However, many are looking to our government to take an active leadership role in supporting these Ontarians struggling with mental illness. Question. The first phase of the mental health strategy was focused focused on children and youth. Minister, how will you continue your commitment to the segment of the population in the second phase? Thank you. Minister. To the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I too want to thank the member from Davenport for raising this very important question. As she said, uh, the first three years of our mental health strategy has been focused on children and youth, and that's because it was the right and the smart thing to do, Speaker. Today, more than an additional 50,000 children and youth and their families are be benefiting from these initiatives and programs. And while we are proud of our accomplishments, we know there's more to do. My ministry will continue to work with our partners and transform the child and youth mental health system through our Moving on Mental Health Plan and promote community mobilization as we move into year two of our Youth Suicide Prevention Plan. Together, we will help young people with, the mental, health, with mental health illnesses enjoy the very bright uh, future that I think we'll all agree Answer. they deserve. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Minister, in June of, 20, of June of 2013, the County of Renfrew published a business case for accelerating the expansion of, expansion of Highway 17. In that report, it called on your ministry to identify the continued expansion from Shield Drive to the Town of Renfrew in the province's five-year capital works budget. Furthermore, it called on the province to roll out a predictable and multi-year program to fund the planning and implementation of environmental assessment updates, property acquisition, and budget allocations of the continued expansion. The people of my riding understand that the expansion is not only essential for the local economy, but also one of driver safety. Minister, it's been over a year and a half since the county released its report. Will you tell us, what? can you give us an update? Have you seen the report, and what are your comments? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. 
Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke for that question. I also want to commend him for his advocacy with respect to this particular issue and also to say uh, to the county of Renfrew uh, for putting the business case for the accelerated extension of this particular highway forward. Uh, I want to make sure that they understand that it is uh, obviously some great work that's taken place. I know there have been conversations in the past with other ministers of transportation regarding this particular project. Of course, Speaker, uh, as the member opposite would know, uh, the ministry understands the importance of this particular expansion, and uh, we are committed to continuing to make improvements to this particular highway. So, for example, in 2012, as the member would know, we did finish the first phase of expansion from Regional Road 29 to Division Street. Phase 2 from Division Street to Shield Drive is currently under construction. It's expected that this work will be completed in 2016. And beyond that, Speaker, in 2014-15, I think it's important Answer. to note our government is committing nearly $2 billion to expand and repair Southern Ontario's highways and bridges. I look forward to continuing to work with this member and his county on this important project. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Uh, thank you for that uh, reply, Minister, but we spe we're speaking to beyond Shield Drive, and I will say that your predecessor did identify this as a priority project, and I'm hoping that you will consider it the same. For a decade now, I've received a steady stream of emails, letters, and phone calls to my office con from concerned residents and municipal leaders around the issue of Highway 17. This is a key infrastructure project in eastern Ontario. It's about local economic development. It's also an issue about public safety. I'll ask you again to accept the findings of the county's report for the accelerated extension of Highway 17 and give us a date when you'll be implementing them. We need to know what's going to happen beyond 2016 when the expansion to Shield Drive is complete. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank that member for his uh, for his supplementary question. What I didn't get to say in the um, the opening answer was that the environmental assessment for phases three and four have been updated. Property acquisitions and designation has been initiated. Timing of construction will depend on a number of factors, including detailed design, property acquisition, and additional environmental approvals. I understand why this is important for this member, for this county, and for this part of Ontario, Speaker. I referenced in my initial answer the nearly $2 billion that we're investing in southern Ontario's highways. I have heard not only from this member, but a number of members on that side of the House, the member from Wellington Halton Hills, the member from Perry Sound Muskoka, and others about the importance of investing in crucial infrastructure. It's why, Speaker, we have the Moving Ontario Forward Plan. $29 billion over 10 years for transit, transportation, and other crucial forms of infrastructure. It is encouraging Answer. to hear members on that side of the House understand the enlightenment of our plan. I look forward to their continued support in the years to come. Thanks very much, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Question the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, it's not easy being a student in Ontario, from studying and working full or part-time jobs to paying the highest tuition fees in the country. But nothing makes it harder than trying to do all that while going hungry. Today, post-secondary students are one of the fastest growing groups of food bank users. There is not one college or university campus that doesn't have some kind of food relief program, and many local food banks are setting special hours for post-secondary students. Does the Premier think it is acceptable that increasing numbers of students must rely on food banks in order to afford post-secondary education? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I don't think it's acceptable in as rich a society as we live in that people would go hungry, Mr. Speaker. It's why, it's why we are the first government in Ontario to have a poverty reduction strategy, Mr. Speaker. It's why the focus of our post-secondary uh, policies has been to increase accessibility, to make sure that there were grants in place, to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we reduce tuition so that uh, students would be able to access post-secondary. So, no, Mr. Speaker, I don't, uh, I don't accept that uh, young people should go hungry in this province. And, Mr. Speaker, we are, we're working very hard to make sure that young people and families have everything that they need in order to be able to thrive. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this year's hunger report, released yesterday by the Ontario Association of Food Banks, points out that hunger is rampant on post-secondary campuses because university tuition has increased nearly 40 per cent in just seven years. Students' budgets can't keep up with the rising prices of rent, tuition and food. This government could change that. The Liberals' sky-high tuition policies are forcing more and more students to choose between going hungry 
while they are studying or abandoning, abandoning higher education altogether? Why is this government making hunger another cost of higher education in Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. To Economic Development and Employment and Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this government understands the challenges that students face uh, across this province, a number of different challenges, and the member raises some good points, but she's wrong, Mr. Speaker, uh, in a number of different categories as well. We brought in a 30 per cent off tuition program, Mr. Speaker, that's providing thousands of dollars of savings across this province to students. Order. Mr. Speaker, a student today that's receiving the 30 per cent off tuition grant is paying the same amount of tuition today they would have been paying 10 years ago. Mr. Speaker, that's the fact. Now, that doesn't mean we're done. That doesn't mean we're going to keep working with students in post-secondary institutions to do everything we can to improve education for, for, uh, through in our universities and colleges and to ensure, Mr. Speaker, we keep a cap on, uh, on tuitions, which we've lowered the amount that uh, post-secondary institutions can, can raise tuitions. We're working with students, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We'll continue to address the challenge. Question, the member from Etobicoke North. Merci, Monsieur le... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Bob Shirelli. P and MD, I was pleased to learn of the recent Health Canada study on the effects of wind turbines, which found no evidence, I repeat, no evidence to support a link between wind turbine noise and self-reported illnesses, stress, or impacts on sleep. This scientifically grounded study, Speaker, which included participants from communities across southwestern Ontario and PEI, is considered to be an international class study, the most comprehensive investigation to date. Health Canada study supported Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health conclusion that there is no direct causal link between wind turbine noise and adverse health effects. Minister, with the results of these studies now confirming that there are no adverse health effects from wind turbine noise, will our government be relaxing its rules with regards to the siting of wind energy projects? Question. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member from Etobicoke North for the question. And our government's priority continues to be ensuring that renewable energy projects are developed in a way that respects communities and is protective of human health and the environment. And we appreciate Health Canada's work on building the science around wind projects. It found no link between wind turbine noise and adverse health effects. And local decision making and health continue to be our top priorities going forward. Mr. Speaker, siting continues to be as important as ever. Our government has set standards for renewable energy projects, including noise limits to protect Ontarians, and we continue to have the toughest setback standards in North America at a minimum distance of 550 metres. Our government is committed to continuing to improve the siting of energy infrastructure in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have a deferred vote. On the motion for allocation of time on Bill 35, an act to repeal the Public Works Protection Act, amend the Police Services Act with respect to court security and act security for electricity generating facilities and nuclear facilities act 2014. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take your seats? All members, please take your seats. On December the 2nd, Mr. Neck, we move government notice of motion number 12. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Neck, Mr. Neck, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Mayor, 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 Mr.